Welcome, everybody. Let me call this meeting of the Advisory Finance Committee meeting to Advisory Finance Committee to order. This is meeting number six of February 20, uh, fiscal year 22. Today is September 15th, 2022. Pursuant to Article 20 of the Acts of 2021, meetings conducted by hybrid means will be conducted in person and via remote access in accordance with applicable law. This means that members of the public body may access these meetings in person or via remote means using the link posted. When required by law or allowed by the chair, persons wishing to provide public comment or otherwise participate in the meeting may do so by accessing the meeting by in-person attendance only. Additionally, meetings are broadcast in real time via Westboro TV, Verizon Channel 28, or Charter Channel 192, and they are recorded concurrently and will appear as soon as possible on the Westboro TV YouTube channel. So, uh, without objection, we'll dispense with the minutes at the end of the meeting. Okay. Tonight we're going to be discussing Articles 11 and 12 of the library project. Um, welcome Mary Johnston and um, Maureen uh, Amiot, uh, library director. Maureen, I'm going to leave it up to you to introduce anybody else that's here, please. Sure. I'd as be you happy see to. fit. I'm so. uh, Maureen Amiot, 6 Arch Street, library director. Mary Johnston, 5 Sandra Pond Road, chair of the Library Board of Trustees. And I have um, with us tonight is um, Eric Moore from Lamoureux Pagano Architects. And uh, Frank Payor from Fontaine Brothers, our construction manager. And Steve Theron from Vertex, our owner's project manager. So are you ready for us to get started? You have the floor for Excellent. your presentation. Thank you. Um, Give me one sec. Let's try that again. There we go. Uh, I know some of you are more familiar with our project than others, so I want to just give a quick um, sort of high-level rundown of how we got to the point where we're at uh, today. So we started in 2012 with a needs assessment that showed our library was undersized for our then current and future population. Our state agency, the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners, or MBLC, who you'll hear a lot about tonight, announced a grant for planning and design for renovation slash expansion of public libraries in 2013. We were awarded a planning and design grant in 2014, and the result was a document called the Building Program, which describes the library that Westboro wants and needs. That document was based on focus groups, surveys, demographics, and other population data. Uh, that document is posted on the library's website and in the library building committee Google Drive. It's available publicly if you'd like to read it. Uh, the MBLC then announced construction grants in 2016 to implement everyone's uh, building programs. We applied in early 2017 and we were notified that summer that we would be receiving a grant but we were waitlisted at num we were placed at number 11 on a waitlist for funds it, it took us until July of 2021 to move to the top of the waiting list and at that point work began on a refresh of the earlier design and a new cost estimate we reformed our library building committee last October the committee selected a new owner's project manager in January of this year. We then went on to apply for construction manager at risk uh, as a delivery method for this project in April, and we were notified in May that the application was approved. Our $9.4 million provisional grant was awarded by the MBLC in July. That award started the clock. The MBLC requires the town to approve and fund the project within six months of the award. That's why it's provisional, and that's why it's appearing on the fall town meeting warrant. 
We then began the process to hire a construction manager, which consisted of a pre-qualification phase, an invitation to submit proposals, interviews, and then the selection and award. That process just concluded a couple weeks ago at the end of August, and we were delighted to um, bring Fontaine Brothers on board. The team at Fontaine immediately began working to create their own cost estimate and reconcile it with the one created by the design team over the summer. We received the updated design in August, and the updated cost estimate came just last Friday. The next few slides will give you a preview of the new design that was just completed. The renovated library will feature a new side entrance on Parkman with a ramp and stairs leading to the door. A covered porch will allow for outdoor seating and programs. Above the covered porch is an enclosed outdoor children's space that is located off the new upstairs children's department. This is a view from the back corner showing um, the new windows on um, the parking lot side of the building that will allow for a lot of natural light to come in. The new children's department will be located on the top floor and will feature early literacy areas, interactive technology, and large windows. Westboro history will be woven into the design, like this concept of seating slash early literacy play area for young children that honors Westboro's history as a transportation hub. In the back left is a space that could be used for STEM programming and hands-on activities. Interactive technology will be a feature as well, with elements like a large touch screen on the wall. Books and materials for adults would be located on the main and lower levels. The larger, more flexible meeting room is located at the back of this area with access to the covered porch. Study rooms, which have been a request from the community for years, will be added, along with small conference rooms. Much to the delight of residents, restrooms will be added on every floor. We currently have two single-person restrooms on the lower level, and um, if you're uh, at a meeting on the top floor, it's a very long distance to get to the restrooms. Um, new electric-powered heating and air conditioning systems are planned, and electrical and data infrastructure will be improved. Teens will have a larger, more appropriate space in the lower level in proximity to the rest of the adult materials. Staff will also have a work area on the lower floor. Storage, which is badly needed, is added as well. The historic 1908 building will have a full interior renovation to restore woodwork, replace windows that are rotting, and replace the roof. The Westboro Center for History and Culture will get a larger space in the 1908 building and will have an archival space that will appropriately house our most precious documents and photographs for future generations. It's our intention to preserve and improve the library, a showpiece on West Main Street, and add an addition that blends with the old in a way that honors the beauty of the existing building and incorporates Westboro's past, present, and future. Now, a little bit about costs, which is why we're all here. Oh, I'm sorry, before we go on to that, um, I did add in a timeline just to give you a sense, because we get a lot of questions about what's going to happen when. So on this slide, we're in the community outreach phase at right now. The little star uh, in the 2022 block is uh, the town meeting vote on October 17th. Uh, after the town meeting vote, assuming that the project is approved, there would be um, a little over a year of design work that would need to be done. The design is um, still in the very early schematic conceptual stages. So further design will be needed. Um, it's ex that's expected to take until January of 2024. Construction will begin in, in February of 2024 and end about May of 2025. Um, occupancy, as you can see, of the new library would be in June of 2025 with a closeout period following that. So on to costs. Our designers and construction manager just finished their reconciliation this past Friday, and the new cost estimate for the project is $36,698,556, with $9.4 state grant 
This would leave approximately 27.3 million that would come from the town or other resources. The overall cost is about a 54% increase from the 2016 estimate. We've talked with other waitlisted librarians in the same situation, and that increase is in line with the estimated their estimated cost increases. This is a pandemic slash inflation issue that is hitting libraries and municipal projects across the state. It is important to note that the state grant has not changed and will not change. We also want to note that Westboro Public Library Foundation was formed in 2017 and plans to contribute $1 million towards the project. They have done some quiet fundraising and plan to launch a full capital campaign once the project is approved. We didn't account for the $1 million in our calculations since it's not currently underway. The most impactful component of this cost is construction. The 2022 construction estimate is from the construction manager that we brought on this summer. They have the expertise and the incentive to make this estimate as accurate as possible. It's also been checked, confirmed, and reconciled with a separate independent estimate done by the design team. Mm -hmm. We feel this is a conservative estimate, meaning that we expect the actual costs somewhat lower. The entire project team will do our utmost to keep costs below this estimate, and there are opportunities at larger, later stages in the process for value engineering and grants that could reduce the final cost. Our OPM and designer can address the methods used to determine these costs in a few minutes if you would like to know more. So why now? Westboro's population in 1980 at the time of the last renovation was 13,619. We're now at 21,499 and projected to continue growing over the coming decades. In 1980, we didn't have cell phones, internet, Wi-Fi, or libraries of things. We had card catalogs and we loaned books. Our services and the desires and expectations of our community and even the way people use libraries have changed dramatically in that time. Libraries are no longer silent, dusty book warehouses but are now dynamic, busy community hubs where people come to meet each other, learn new things, create, search for jobs, and sometimes even work using our Wi-Fi and computers. And yes, read. Libraries are the one place people can go in a community where they aren't expected to buy anything. Everyone is welcome. It's open to everyone, no matter your age or background, and you can stay as long as you want. With that said, there are a number of issues that need to be addressed with the existing library. Our space needs study in 2012 called out a few specific areas that were deficient in regard to space. The current teen space, I don't, if you have been in lately, in the late afternoon, is directly across from a quiet reading room. So you can imagine the issues that that may cause. The space only holds about 10 students, so all of our classes and events for teens end up being held outdoors or in the meeting room. Teens who want to come and study have to contend with other teens who want to work collaboratively on projects, so a bigger multi-purpose space is, de is desperately needed. The other space I'll note is the children's department, which also needs additional space. Our population of children has grown tremendously since the 1980 edition was built, but so has the body of research about early literacy and brain development. Mr. Rogers famously said, play is the work of children, and our children need a space that fosters early literacy through manipulatives, toys, and programs geared for their specific needs so they can do their important work. With regard to the structure of the building, there are other issues I wanna point out. The windows in the old building are the original single pane windows that were installed in 1908. The exterior wood sills are rotted and are held together right now with putty and paint. We were approved for replacement windows several years ago at town meeting, but we opted to return the funds to the town and wait for the construction grant to help pay for them. We can no longer open most of them, and if we do, we can't get them closed easily again. The putty and paint is a band-aid. The windows are in dire need of replacement. Our electrical structure is inadequate for a modern library as well. When the addition was built in 1980, we didn't need to charge mobile devices or use computers the way we do now. In our staff in public areas, we sought help from an electrician to safely link power strips together in order to run all the computers we need. It wasn't ideal, 
but it was the only way we could safely get electricity where we needed it due to the lack of outlets. The center area of the adult section where the, our study tables are located has no power whatsoever. Our plan for the new building includes electrifying our heating and cooling systems to meet the requirements in the Climate Action Plan. This means replacement of our gas-powered boiler that you see on the slide and our 1980s era fan coil units that are in place throughout the building. Our data infrastructure is also inadequate for a modern library. Our staff computers are hardwired for speed and security, but our Wi-Fi signal is inadequate at best. Library users would like us to be able to live stream events like lectures and demonstrations, but we don't have the bandwidth. The architecture of the building pr prevents a strong signal from being carried from the top floor where our equipment is located to all points throughout the building. We don't have a wire closet or a server room. Instead, our data cabling and hardware sits on a tabletop and it runs through a cardboard box into an opening in the wall. People working from home, students doing homework and research, and residents looking for videos or music need a much more robust signal than what we currently can offer. One of the, the questions we get often is, well, why don't you just repair what you have? Just fixing things like the windows, upgrading electrical systems, installing an ADA compliant elevator, or replacing the 116 year old slate roof and fixing some structural issues would require us to come into full compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act and to bring the entire bu building fully up to code. Repairs of this nature are not eligible under for grant funding from the MBLC and never will be. When we applied for our grant in 2017, an outside review panel of architects, project managers, and library directors who had done building projects in the past reviewed our application and agreed it was worthwhile and necessary and funded it at an amount of $9.4 million. This grant is a once-in-a-generation or possibly once-in-a-lifetime chance for us as a town to have the opportunity to rethink the way we offer library services for the next 50 years. For us as a town to have the opportunity to rethink the way Yep, for the next 50 years. It will allow us to continue to be innovative in the way we offer our services to the community with enough space for public events, meetings, study spaces, and outdoor space requested by residents. Passing on the grant funds would mean waiting years for another grant opportunity while costs continue to rise or doing the repairs piecemeal and having to come back again and again for repairs. The building as it stands today needs significant work and with $9.4 million coming from the state, now is the time to do it. So here we've compared the cost of the full renovation with what we're calling Plan B, the essential renovations that would be needed to keep the library functional in compliance with the ADA and current building codes and in the existing building. It's important to note this is not a Plan A or Plan B decision that we're making at town meeting. It's a Plan A. And if the article fails at town meeting, we can't go and just implement plan B. There's a lot more work that would have to go into that, but we wanted to bring you and some figures and some numbers to give you the context of what that would actually cost, because we, we know that that's something people are asking. So we asked our architect to evaluate what would need to be done and to provide a very rough order of magnitude, high level cost for the work. They were hired to design a renovated, expanded library for us, not to um, design base repairs. So this is very ballpark numbers. Uh, it's also important to note, we would not be able to use our current state grant to pay for this. And as Mary said, the MBLC will not fund uh, repairs like this now or in the future. If the town does not approve the full renovation, the library will need essential repairs. And we'll, ha we'll have to scrap the current plans, which is 10 years of work, and determine whether to do the uh, repairs piecemeal or all at once, sometime in the next few years. Our $9.4 million will be forfeited and will be awarded to another municipality. We don't get to move to the bottom of the list and wait. There are seven municipalities left on the waiting list and another 40 that have expressed interest 
should there be a future grant round. The MBLC is currently drafting new requirements and procedures for awarding grants, so libraries will not be waitlisted as long as we have ever again. Those documents have not been released, and no information is available yet on if or when there might be another grant round. Regulatory hearings are scheduled for early November, and a new bond would have to be authorized at the state level to fund future grants. With new leadership at the State House coming in, there's no way to know whether a bond is on the horizon. As, and as we all know, this project is not going to get any less expensive if we wait. The Library Building Committee and Library Trustees realize this is a big project, and it's coming at a time of historic inflation. But it may be our only chance to access MBLC grant funds, fix the known issues, improve our library, and give residents the library they want, they need, and they deserve to have. We have already invested 10 years of work and resources into this plan, and with millions already in hand, I can't see walking away from it now. As I said to the select board the other night, there's a child who isn't even born yet who is going to be amazed when, they, when he or she walks into that new children's department in a few years and sees all there is to offer. I personally can't wait for that moment, and I hope you can be there with me to see it too. So thank you for giving us the time to explain a little bit about our project, and we would love to answer your questions. Thank you, Maureen. Mary, um, floor is open for questions. Andrew? So I was curious to know, we've talked about uh, all the changes that are happening, there's a lot of new space coming in. Could you talk a little bit about the plans, about what changes in terms of the volume of space you had? You talked about new studying rooms, um, new meeting rooms. Could you talk about the expanded capacity? Because that's going to go to my follow-up question is, once we have the space for the people, let's look outside the building and, and can we talk a little bit about where the people are going to park and stay and, and the impact on the surrounding area? But, but I don't know how much capacity we're talking about adding here, but that was certainly part of one of the things you talked about. So do the best you can. And, and yeah. yeah, thank you. Eric, can you address the square footage? Eric, Eric Moore, Lamarro, Lamarro Pagano Architects. Um, so the, the, uh, the changes that came about, uh, just the, the reason behind it was that in 2016, when we made the uh, grant application to MBLC, they came back with uh, uh, a list of com co comments, review comments, and we never had the chance to, uh, because the pr project went on the wait list and basically went on hiatus, we never had the chance to address those comments. So this was an opportunity uh, more recently when we came back on for the update to uh, to address those and a lot of them had to do with things like outdoor space um, the connection of an outdoor space to the building a lot of adjacencies um, they said the site the site's very small you don't have room for parking we'd love to have some parking on the site but obviously it, there's there's really no room for parking so long story short the the uh, the differences between what we had then in 2016 and what we have now um, are fairly minor in terms of square footage within a couple or three percent uh, of, of the area um, and they have mostly to do with the addition of, of more meeting rooms and, it, and these would be like the smaller uh, private like three or four to six person meeting rooms um, I get, and maybe I'm not looking for actual numbers of square feet, so I, I please don't. Okay. Mean, I don't mean to put you on the spot here. No, no, I, I, but I do have the. I'm a little ignorant about what we have right now. Maybe we have three conference rooms that'll hold 30 people, and soon we're going to have six conference rooms that'll hold 70 people, because that that plays directly into the question about inside, sure, but where are they parking outside? How are they getting there and that's stuff like that? So th that's the through line I'm hoping to. It's to looking hear a for uh, existing 
to future, yep. not, not necessarily 2016 to 2020. Right, I'm not trying to compare like, them in uh, terms of square architectural footage changes. Or a number of meeting rooms. It, it's number of people. I mean, I mean, you yeah, can. I, I would anticipate that you'll see an increase. You'll see an increase in the in the in the number of, of library patrons who use the, yep. the library. We've seen that at every every project we've done. We did Shrewsbury Library. They immediately saw saw a. Uh, an a significant increase in the number of people. Um, and even though you don't have parking on site, we're, we're going to maintain the existing parking that you have. Um, the plan is to continue to use the, uh, the church parking lot because there is that, that agreement there. Um, and there are quite a few spaces within um, a fairly small radius of, of, uh, you know, of the library for, for public parking. So we, we anticipate that, that those will be used as well. Well, I also know that Westboro is looking to buy a property nearby to turn into a parking space, and that didn't happen a couple of years ago. So my perspective right now is that the space is constrained. Uh, um, and, and what I'm hearing is we're going to have more capacity to bring in more people to space that is constrained. And I may, maybe the timing is different for when people are there, so that's not as impactful. But, but in, in an area that is already a capacity for everything else, I would love to know what consideration you have or, 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 or thoughts you have about dealing with this as a capacity question. There's really not a lot that we can do mm -hmm. related to this project, related to parking. Yep. Uh, the town, as you know, did a comprehensive parking study a couple years ago that um, somehow showed that there's no parking problem in the downtown area which is not the outcome that we were hoping for. Uh, we were hoping for some better solutions that would help us um, be able to address that as a you know, facet of our project. But there's really, I mean, there's nowhere on our site that we could add parking and there's nowhere yeah. adjacent to us that we could add parking. So yeah. um, it's not really something that we can do. I will say um, this project was known during the time in which that parking study was done and taken into consideration. A large part of our capacity increase in the teen area is for our teens who already walk to the library. They yeah. come right after school, they come from Gibbons, they come from the high school, and in those afternoon hours, that is not gonna impact parking downtown. The children's room and children's programming typically occurs during the day, and that staggers also things that happen downtown. Thank you. Gene? Have you seen a, um, an increase in demand for those smaller rooms um, due to more people working remotely? And have you made adjustments to, to account for that in the plans? We currently don't have any. Yeah. So, and we have requests for them all the time. Like all right. we have right now are the little study tables that are at the ends of the, the rows where the um, nonfiction books are on the main floor. And um, we, we see people who come and spend the entire day sitting at those tables because they're working remote. And, um, and they want those study rooms to be able to close the door and take a Zoom call. And we don't have anywhere in the building that they can do that, other than our 40-person meeting room, that if it's available, we're happy to let them use it to take their Zoom call. But um, that's the only quiet space we have where you can close the door. And it's something, there was a, my very first strategic plan after I started working at the library 12 years ago, people were asking for study rooms. And they had been asking for them um, every time there was a public survey from my predecessor as well. So it's something they want, that, and we need even more now that people are, are working from home. Um, it is one of the things that we had planned in to have some smaller rooms that we've had the opportunity because it is post-COVID and we've been on the waiting list to plan more in. So that is a change that has been made. It's one of the advantages for being on the wait list in the post-COVID years. We can plan for this library. Should we be in the situation where we were the past couple of years, we can service more functionally in, a, in the new library, our patrons. So yes, that has been taken into account in our current plans. Well, I get plenty of time with these yeah. things. <laughs> I know you did. I don't need just to ask anything. 
Yeah, let, 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 me, let me start out. So um, Rod Shaffert, I'm at E. Parkman, so you know, I have a number of vested interests here, which you know, obviously disclose. So I'm, I'm the abutter, the one who will be most impacted by the project. So that's kind of hat number one. Hat number two is I'm a construction professional, so you know, I understand this process and want to be helpful to the process. Uh, and hat number three is, you know, I was a member of the advisory finance committee. You know, I'm obviously want to uh, uh, represent the taxpayers of, of Westboro. So let, let me start out by saying kudos to this team and uh, from the library committee to Lamro and Pagano, uh, Dimio, who I think is a great selection. I have great respect for Chad Bergeron, their, their estimator. Shout out, Chad. Uh, and uh, also Vertex. Uh, I know Steve very well as well. So I, I think you've got a great team here together. Uh, that, that being said, you know, I, I do have concerns and I think Walter shared kind of a list of questions and, you know, I'd like to run through those now if we could. So since, since Eric's up there now, I'll start in the design and I, I, I guess, you know, and, and another kudos, you've done a great job of your Google Docs and sending all the information there that's available to look at. So. You know, when I look at the 2016 report, it said you needed about 5,400 square feet of additional space. And now I'm not sure what the latest estimate is, but it's, it's over 30,000 square feet. So uh, from what was originally proposed, it seems like that amount is doubled. And, you know, I, I realize there's a real conundrum here in terms of the grant and what the MBLC wants. And you're trying to weigh the very tight site with the constraints of what's required. But, but I, I'm wondering whether we really need 10,000 square feet of additional space. And you, also, when I see some of these outdoor uh, spaces like the playroom now, uh, I think those are adding addition. The playroom, the porch, I think those are adding additional square footage to the building, which is already very constrained on the site. So, you know, I, I think from my perspective, I, I would challenge the design team to come up with a more efficient uh, building from a square footage, and I, I realize we're only at 10% design, so I think there's still opportunities to do so. So, so we, um, in 2016, we actually um, made the recommendation for an, a, for an additional 12,735 gross square feet. Um, it, that was initially, uh, our initial report based on MBLC's requirements for a, include it, which included a very large meeting room was for a, an additional 16,357 square feet. But we worked with MBLC because of the close proximity of the Forbes building and the large, large meeting room there. We worked with MBLC and they, they uh, allowed us to omit that, that requirement for the large meeting room. So I'm, I'm not sure where the 5,000 square foot figure came from, but in 2016, we were at uh, an additional 12,735, uh, 12, and we've we've more or less kept kept that. Uh, I think we actually have made the building a little more efficient than it than it was, um, and we we've we've tried to recognize MBLC's requirements and and adhere to them, um, and also recognize their their review comments where, where they asked for um, things like an outdoor area that connected to the to the building with the uh, with the building being at at a half level to the to the current grade entry makes it very difficult to have an outdoor space where you can just come come and go from that space and we felt that the uh, the covered porch uh, you know it was in keeping with the uh, context of the of the beautiful downtown areas and, and the historic houses with their front porches as being an outdoor space that people would, would enjoy. But it was also in, in re readily available from the, from the library. It could open right out from the, from the large meeting room, from the medium-sized meeting room and, and other areas as well. I think um, something else that this committee should be aware of is that we are committed to to, we are stuck to the guidelines that MBLC gave us when we were awarded the grant. We as a library trustees went back to them post-COVID, asked them, can you increase our funding? The answer was no. And we asked them, okay, well, what can you do on square footage? This is a very different project than it was before. And the answer was, you can be creative 
in how you move things around on the inside, but the square footage increase that they approved back in 2016 for the grant cannot be any lower. Can we just talk about that a little more uh, from the standpoint of utilization? Uh, I didn't recall seeing anything on your website, but is there utilization data available for uh, use of the library prior to this project, like let's say up until last year? Are you talking about like checkout data? I'm how talking many about how door? many people use the library yeah. in very simple terms. Yeah. And um, you have that data. I do have that data, yeah. Okay. And I'll, um, I didn't realize it wasn't there, so I'll make sure it gets posted um, tomorrow. But um, I can tell you last fiscal year, that's one of the data points that we have to report to the state. Um, our, our door count last year was 107,606 um, for the fiscal year. We're still... Um, significantly lower than we were in 2019 as far as door count. Um, we used 2019 as our benchmark because obviously 2020 we were closed most of the year. 2021 we were open with limited hours and slowly adding services and hours over that point. Do you have 2019? 2019 it was 155,380. So we're still off by about 31 percent. However, in that time period, um, our circulation of materials, so everything checked out, including physical items and um, e-books, e-audio books, um, in uh, fiscal 22, it, that number was 265,405. In 2019, it was 238,414. So we have surpassed and um, gone past, I mean, blown by our 2019 numbers by about 11%. And year over year, an 11% um, circulation increase in normal times, we would be um, jumping up and down with joy. And, you know, for it to be in post-COVID times makes us incredibly happy. Yes, yeah, so, but we don't know if you can sustain that rate of growth in your utilization. So my, oh, we know my, we can do that. Okay, my next. <laughs> we, okay. we absolutely I, I can do that. I appreciate your confidence. That's <laughs> and, great. Yeah, we That's fully good. intend to increase that as time goes okay. on. Okay, so um, do you have any um, projections for utilization at, of the new facility? I really don't because I don't know how I could forecast that. Looking at the last two years of data, I could start at 2019 and kind of but dream we're big. But projecting all um, this additional square footage, what is it? We're just going to hope that I, I got to be careful. I don't want to be condescending with this, so I apologize on how it comes out. It sounds like we're projecting all this additional square footage in the hope that people, more people come. The if you build it, they will come model wow. of projection. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, yes? that doesn't. You know, I, I, I guess, I, I'm just when I think about the scope of the project as it now is from 2016, with all the new rooms you're adding, and and I, you know, I commend you for for the thought process that has gone on here. I, I just wonder if I could justify that in my own mind with projected utilization Sorry, if I, if you if you can't I mean I could, I could tell you that it's going to increase by 40 percent year over year but I have can, you can't demonstrate I can't that, demonstrate though. that I'm okay. not sure how so I would you, demonstrate so we that ha we if, have to I would love to know um, I would love to know what that number would be but you know based on what Eric has mentioned earlier um, in the libraries that had completed um, projects saw an immediate increase in usage. And I have no reason to expect that that wouldn't happen here as well. well. I, I hope so. I agree with you. Uh, so go ahead, if, Mary. I, if, you, if I mind. Yeah. So I understand what you're saying. When I look at the proof is in the pudding, when I look at our programming, our programming is routinely capped and sold out over and over again because we can't hold the capacity. So to me, that says people, we always have wait lists for our programs because we can't let them all in. So increasing that 
that's where I look to see. Yeah, I'm just there. trying to see the proportionality. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, new buildings are going to attract more people, so you'll have that quick addition. And then, but we don't know what the long term sustainability of that kind of number is going to look like. Uh, it would be, you know, I know it's, it's hard to do. I understand it. But perhaps somewhere between now and the town meeting, it's a month, we I, could get some reasonable it projections be, of use. It, it may be helpful. Um, I can reach out to the other libraries that, that have completed be, yeah, recently. Some comparative, and at see, least, so um, we understand what's going on. Because I am imagining that what will happen here is very similar to what happened there. Uh, fingers crossed, because we're asking our friends and neighbors to dedicate a lot of money over the next 15 to 20 years. Their money, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sorry, Rob. No, I think, go, Andrew. Go to if I may, I, just while we're on that number about the circulation, mm -hmm. I remember about three years ago, I was able to marry up two numbers that had been shared in separate forms, and it was about one in nine or one in 10 items that were checked out were items that were coming from the greater library network. Mm -hmm. Do you know if that is still generally the same, or, or maybe that's not the same apples to apples that we're talking about here? So, yeah, I do have that number, because um, that's also a data point that we report. So uh, last year, we received 19,957 items from other libraries. So 19,957 out of the 265, 405. Okay. However, it, we don't have a way to differentiate with our eBooks and e-audio which library purchased it. And like, am I using Shrewsbury's copy? Is someone in Pittsfield using our copy? We don't have a way to split that out. So it may not be quite an apples to apples comparison, but for our physical items that we check out, we received um, just under 20,000. Okay, thank you. That, that's about one in 13 items. It's like a, a, one more reason that the library is leveraged, super leveraging what it has. So I, that's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Brad? So just, just to stay on design for a minute, um, and I, I want to thank the library for you know being helping me in the, establishing the setback. We established a 10-foot setback off the rear property line, which you know I think makes sense. Uh, I, I wonder if Fontaine has thought any about, more about logistics in terms of how they would plan to build that. And, you know, I think you have two, two well, actually you have three constraints. One, one is the back property line. Uh, two is Parkman Street with the existing electrical lines uh, there. And then, you know, the church on the other side. So I wonder if you've given any thought in sure. terms yeah. of how you're going to build this. You hit it right on the, right on the money. The, uh, your constraint because of the the wires that uh, is a one-way street going into the uh, or the police use that to come in and out so that's not the ideal place to set up your property is directly behind it also really leaves you with the, the church as your best uh, position to uh, construct a building take down the old building that is really the key to the project from a construction standpoint that's that's how we, we want to tackle it so I, I also wonder from a design standpoint how close the roof line of uh, the building as proposed would be to those power lines. Is it a 10 feet? We're required to stay at least 10 feet away from those. So is, is the building 10 feet off the sidewalk? It's a little further than, than 10 feet from the, from the uh, power lines as it stands. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? I have a couple of questions. Ellie? Um, so you, one of the things you talked about was door count. Mm -hmm. Is that, are the replication in those numbers, like if somebody comes and goes multiple times within the course of the day, it, did you account for that or? We don't have a way to account for that. It's not, our system isn't that like smart to know that you came in, you left, and then two hours later you came in and left again. It, that's strictly the number of people through the door in a year. Okay. Uh, the only way that we would be able to, um, to track that number would be to have people sign in or for us to keep a record of 
who came and went, and uh, we don't do that for privacy law reasons. Okay. Um, I guess my other, it's not necessarily a question so much as the, the quote you used at the end with regard to you know an unborn child being able to have access to this amazement. Um, and I'm thinking, but there's a lot of people paying for it. So there was a lot of focus on children's area, teen area. I'm thinking for the people that are paying for it, what other than kind of the private study, I didn't hear a lot geared toward those finance in it. So currently, by providing space for our teens and our children, it opens up the space for other age groups because right now it's a shared space. The teens are right there on the main floor with everybody else. And so by, by moving them and giving them their own space, it allows us to provide more seating areas that they're looking for right now so that they can come and enjoy the library, more tables for work, and more of those spaces that we can do on the main floor for them as well. We also right now um, have one meeting room that holds 40 people. So we can have one program going on in that room at a time, one event, one lecture, one speaker. So if we have something scheduled for, um, for teens in that room because they can't fit in the teen space, we can't use that at the same time for an adult program. Um, we can't bring on an author or do a lecture. Uh, our new space will have a dividable meeting room, so we would be able to do multiple programs at the same time and have that shared space. Uh, I, get, I get the complaints from the people who are trying to use the quiet study space to read the newspaper, and they have a, a group of kids across the way in the teen room who are, they're really just talking to each other in a normal um, volume level, but they're working on a project <laughs> together, they're collaborating, they're, they may be um, drawing, doing posters, whatever, and it's aggravating the people who are trying to read. So like Mary said, it's gonna allow us to have appropriate quiet space, noisier space that are not adjacent to each other. That's what Eric mentioned with adjacencies earlier. Does that answer your question? It does. Um, I guess the last thing is um, with the numbers, and it, this might be a question for Monday because I think somebody's coming in. The actual cost, like the compounded interest cost, do you have an idea what that is over the course of the 20 years? I think we can. Uh, is that something we table wait for until Monday? Monday evening? Okay. When the finance director is with us. And we're going to be talking about the tax impact of mm -hmm. the project at that time. Gotcha. Okay. So let's, let's if we could, let's That's hold fine. that. Okay. She would definitely be able to give you a better answer. <laughs> <laughs> If you don't mind, I, I, I do want to drill down on the costs a little bit because, you know, obviously it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a big issue and uh, understanding how they were developed I think is important. So, uh, you know, the first question I would have is, you know, given the drawings are, you know, by your words, about 10% complete, what's the range of the level of ac accuracy that you would think this estimate was? In other words, did you take the high range, the low range, the middle range, or, or, or where, the, where would you anticipate that cost is? Um, so, so the process we went through to, uh, to do the cost estimates, Lamarro Pagano had our own cost estimator and uh, Fontaine Brothers performed their own independent cost estimate. It wasn't a collaborative effort. We didn't work together to match up numbers. We each worked in our own isolation and vacuum, if you will, and, and came up with uh, a complete estimate. And then we sat down and over a period of days, um, reconciled those estimates and made sure that that we had you know that we were both talking about the same amount of space and 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 made made some of the same assumptions the drawings are at a schematic level so it's it is fairly early in the, in the process um, in terms of cost estimating we have to rely on on square foot numbers we haven't fully designed things and for those for that reason we always carry a uh, design contingency, which I, I know you know because you're in the business what a design contingency is, but not everybody does. So I'll try and explain it. Um, maybe Stephen could, could jump in and help me if I, if I falter there. But we, we carry a percentage at, at this level, and, and at schematic design, it's typically like 
10 or 12 percent of the of the total construction cost as a design contingency and as we develop more refined drawings and details and and start to really we're able to really wrap our, our arms around the uh, the project and specify you know it, certain types of HVAC equipment units and, th and that sort of thing we can we can reduce that design contingency so it at, at, we're at schematic design now we're, when we get to the end of design development you know it might go down to five or six percent and then when we're at 75 percent construction documents when we do another cost estimate it might be um, it might be one or two percent at that point and ultimately the idea is it just draws down to zero it's not it's not money that you really get back it's it's just a way to kind of predict what what might happen with the, the design as as you um, as you refine it so unfortunately we didn't get to see the full estimate till this afternoon I haven't looked at it but the the 10 or 12 percent that you're talking about is in the Fontaine estimate because it's not on this, this it, line it, item. It is. Either. It's it's in it's in both both uh, estimates were carried. It's it's part of that construction cost line item. Okay. So it's it's in that twenty seven point uh, five five number. Okay. Andrew, could I ask a question? Of, uh, as I'm thinking about it, the moving in temp site, what what is the and where does that million dollars come from? Because as I think about the, the effort to move in and out of that building, given how much is there, that seems grossly underestimated. Um, we, we don't know what the temporary library will look like or where it will be. That's, that's really a, a placeholder at this point based on experiences we've had, had previously. Um, when we did the Shrewsbury Library, they were fortunate enough to uh, to have uh, the former state-owned Clavin Center site, um, they, which they had purchased for a school use, and they were able to use one of the buildings there, um, and outfitted it up with a new fire alarm system, and use that. It, obviously, it wasn't uh, as as large as their their library, but um, it worked for them. Um, and that you might have have that ability here in Westboro. Uh, you might have an existing town building that's that's readily available but we we really don't we we don't know what that what that is um we've we've allocated i think seven hundred and fifty thousand for the building and and another two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for for moving costs because moving it, it is a big undertaking to get everything out of that building and you know all the archives and and that's that's all going to be stored in climate controlled uh you can't oh, just put it in a pod and leave it out in the rain. So. And, and I think this, the million was also the same for the rent, if it was just the reno. So there was the 18 versus the 27 for the reno. It was, reno because well. either way, you have to vacate the building. You, yeah, you I was going to just say, does that mean the assumption is that either project is. would lock Correct. that building down? Okay. Yes. Thank you. That just highlights the amount of work that is needed in the current library in order for us to repair it. Those gutters are built into the facade of the building, yep. so there's a lot of repair that would not be able to happen. So either way, we're looking at that's why those costs are so high. Yeah. I, I just had two last questions, and then I'll turn over the microphone. But uh, uh, the the other cost question was, and I know we're all we've all talked about, but escalation in terms of what what was assumed in the estimate. Thanks, uh, Rod. Steve Theron with Vertex. So that's the challenge with this, is the, the earlier um, numbers were put together six years ago, but also to today, though our escalation goes through a year and a half from now. 7.5% uh, out 18 months from now. That's what we have in the estimate. I'm sorry, it's 7.5% it's for, for the 18 yes. months? Yes. Okay. And, and how how'd you, how'd you derive that? Just well, as, as part of the estimating reconciliation, I, I know you know the process well, is, is what all the estimators are seeing for numbers and what they each combine to say, this is how I looked at it, this is how you looked at it, and this is how we came up with that, uh, and then we come to an agreement on, on what this project will be. So that's that process, and that's what we came up with. So you're saying that project, total project cost might increase by seven and a half percent? No, we're saying what we're carried in, in a, our accounting for in these costs that planned escalation of seven and a half percent and that goes out to that time period. Got yes. It. Thank you. Which uh, is mid 
2024. Yeah, so it's, it's mid, it's actually on the early side of mid, and that's also a, a, a good debate in the industry, is when do you send out that escalation to what point in the project? And the assumption is that not quite to the midpoint do you have most of the project, all the project purchased at that point, and that's when the appropriate time is to carry that escalation because that's when you're done purchasing it. So just as kind of a follow-up on that, when, when would you think we would have the guaranteed maximum price for the project? At what stage? I mean, I think people need to realize that this is just a budget. The, 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 the final price, we don't know till the end of the project, but at a certain point, Fontaine will have a guaranteed maximum price uh, that'll be a real number that they're contractually bound to. At, at, at what point do you think we would have that? So it'll, it'll be very soon, and, and that's a great advantage of the CM at risk process and having the CM involved now as opposed to developing this project and then sending it out to bid and seeing what the bids come in at. But instead, we go through this collaborative process with the numbers in, and, and this, this isn't just a guess, and, and it's not about how accurate this is. This defines what the project is. And so with this next level of estimate that happens at the end of design development, uh, as Eric was describing, the, the design and pricing contingency gets reduced because what happens at that time, we sit down and create another pair of estimates on the design development plans, and we compare those, and we say, okay, geez, what these plans show either comes in at where we are or they come in below or over. And if it's over, we say, okay, where do we have to do with this design because the design gets further developed from the schematic level to that design development level? We say, what do we have to do with this design to get this back in check so that it's in at or below our budget so it makes sense to continue developing that design in accordance with these decisions we're making now so the costs come in with this next level of, of uh, plan development where we need to be? And that's, you, you know well, that's the process. So it isn't. It isn't a guess at what it is now, and then we f wonder where it's going to come in later. We manage that process from the beginning now all the way through, and that's why it's key to have the CM involved at this stage because they're getting good pricing feedback from the market as opposed to that being uh, developed without the benefit of that market involvement from now right to the end. But, but again, so the guaranteed maximum price still isn't that design development. It's not going to be till after you have your filed subbids, right? Couldn't, uh, we will. It'll take us a, about ten months to a year to, uh, from the, you know, after after town meeting vote, assuming there's there's an approval at that point, uh, to complete the construction documents, and then it would go out to bid. Um, there there'd be filed sub bids for for the major trades, and and you couldn't really assemble a guaranteed maximum price right. without those. So it would be a good I at least a year from. From uh, I, w I would say that it would be the beginning of 20, uh, 2024, probably would be. You know, you'd probably have pieces of the guaranteed maximum price. We'd be working on the allowances and the and the and, s and those things, but you couldn't actually have the final number until you bid out the uh, the filed sub trades. Until the documents exist at such a level that you can have a guarantee that right. goes along with it, but it's the process that you get to that point. It, it's a very structured and managed process to, to maintain that price. I appreciate that, but we as a committee are expected to make a recommendation up or down at the town meeting. Right. And obviously we're not going to have the true cost of this project until several months after that town meeting. So we're asking the town meeting to approve this number and knowing we're going to have to come, we may have to come back to them at the spring town meeting, the annual town meeting, or the following fall with another number, with an additional cost on this project. That is something that occurs when things go wrong. And, and I would suggest that- And things always, you know, what, Murphy's well, I, Law? I, I certainly appreciate that, you know, not, <laughs> not being new to the industry, but I know that the town has a very good record uh, of the school projects, for example, of doing exactly this, coming up with a, pro a, a, a number at 10% and delivering those projects, the last two projects, right on time and on budget, at that number that went through this very process. So it is how these projects work to get that early funding and approval to then go spend the money to develop the rest of the project and you manage that throughout to make sure you stay there. And you have extraordinary times 
like what we have just been through, then that can be difficult. But we're already seeing the result of the extraordinary times in the pricing today. So unless we have some other extraordinary time, we should be able to deliver this project exactly the way we're presenting it. And that's what we've done in the last two in town here. At 36 million, 698, exactly. 56. Yeah, exactly as the last two school, two school projects have been delivered, yes. But the last two school projects, I'm new to town, so correct. <laughs> Sorry. Don't touch so, the microphone. I know. Sorry. So one, I think, was the failed school where they demolished and then it was totally a new structure. The other, I'm guessing, is the one out toward McDonald's, that school. Yes. Is that what you're talking about? Okay. Yes. And that was like an appendage to an existing, it, it, and right? And some renovation of the existing as well. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, but I don't know how old y'all's library is. I'm assuming very old. And you're talking about construction that is an addition to a very old building and so I, I guess my perception is the same as some of the other people you, I can't you vote on something and it's a hidden you know we're, we're saying yeah and then you could come back and say oops there's a you know there's a 10 million dollar error but we're already committed and we have to do it I mean that's a lot of money so to I make can, I can appreciate your point yeah. of view I just want to be very clear that this process, the state grant funding process, is the same process that the schools go through. It, we have to estimate ahead of time. We get the money after it's approved, and then we move forward in the planning. It's not unique to the library. It's how these state grants work. And I understand what you're saying, but that's why they build in contingencies into this price already to prepare for those things so that we're not coming back later. And we, that's why, as trustees of the library, we voted on using library trust funds to bring this team on ahead of time so that we could foresee as much as possible because the last thing I want to do is come back to town meeting. Right. The last thing I want to do is my taxes to go up any more than they need to. I'm a taxpayer here in town too and I'm here for the long haul. But as I feel very confident that we made the right decisions in hiring the experts that we did so that we can best prepare for this project. I think it's fair to say if we could foresee the unforeseeable, they wouldn't be unforeseeable, correct? And we understand that with construction. Even as a layman, I, un I, I get that. Uh, can we stick with costs just a little bit more uh, and just talk a little bit about um, your work? You've been working with the DPW, you've been working with the police department, public utilities. Um, what's the estimate of how much of the existing infrastructure above and below ground is going to need to be replaced and what does that represent in terms of the cost of the project itself How, what's the percentage of that um, I have to go through the estimate to extract that to answer are we look at it a, yeah so <clears throat> we're bringing new utilities in new yeah you want to speak to the new water yeah, you speak to it? the building the building is not currently uh, it doesn't have a fire suppression system so that's that that's a requirement need to bring in a new water service for that um, we'll be going with electrified HVAC equipment you know getting away from the fossil fuels um, to meet the climate action plan that's been endorsed by the town so we'll be, we'll be bringing in a new electrical service um, new, new sanitary service um, Yeah, it's it, it's it's uh, you know it's relatively close to the it, we don't we don't have long runs of, of uh, services so it's so it's it's part of the project I, I you know I'd have to go into the estimate and and uh, but but the cost yeah. has been captured the in this number you're presenting captured. to us that was I, that was a big concern of the DPW in particular that mm -hmm. we capture the cost of, of these these improvements and and make sure that you know Parkman Street gets gets resurfaced after the utilities are brought it uh, utility work is done and w so we, we have captured those costs in the uh, construction estimate it, and it's clear obviously that there's going to be disruption around the building site on the roadways and the sidewalks and just in general there's going to be a lot of work going on um, any idea any estimate of how long that disruption disruption is going to exist and is there a has, it, has someone attempted to put a cost I, on I, that? I think that might be something that Frank, Frank could speak to. Um, okay. so, so the worst part of the project is going to be the demolition and then putting up the steel. Once that's 
done, it becomes a fairly s simple project. It's very similar to the Shrewsbury Library. Um, that's going to be, you're going to be probably six months doing that, that task. Right. You know, taking a, we have to date the building, uh, make sure there's hazardous materials in the building, being that old, uh, take, take the old building down, there's underpinning that needs to be done, and then bring a steel in. That's, that will be the, the trip. Once that's done, it becomes a very, uh, for us, a, a basic building to put together. Okay. But there's going to be a disruption to traffic and people will be going in different directions yeah, and trying sure. to find their way around it. And there'll yeah. be numerous police details. Yeah, I'm not going to say there wouldn't be because there no, no, wouldn't no. be. Yeah, yeah, there's good. It's, yeah. you know. It's if $30 you, million dollars worth of work in right. downtown, right. you know, Westbrook. On, so. on a main street. Yeah. Yeah. Literally the main street. Exactly. So yeah. just just quick tag on, and probably, I'm sure Frank knows, there's, they're also lowering the bottom level of the library, which Correct. is anticipated to be led. Yep. So. Yeah, as a neighbor, I'll be interested in hearing how you're going to try to mitigate. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So any costs associated with that have been captured or? Yes. Um, yes. Yep. Captured oh. mechanical ledge removal. Pardon? We, we've we've uh, we've included uh, me mechanically uh, removing the the rock the ledge. Okay. Obviously, we can't go in and drill and blast. In a, no, in I a just want to make sure that, yeah. No, <laughs> gee, going to wake you up. going to wake up Rod. <laughs> you know all the blasting we've done at 3 a.m.? <laughs> well, no, I just, I guess what I'm saying is, that, uh, again, no surprises. I want to make sure that, and I'm sure you have, captured even these little details because pennies make dollars and you know how that we, works. We have, and I, I, I don't know if everybody knows this, but this is the same team that worked together on the uh, Shrewsbury Public Library project, which is a very, very similar project. It had the historic 1904 building in front. You have, your building is 1908, so it's you know four years younger, but it, it's essentially the same, same kind of project in terms of that historic centerpiece, the jewel of the the project, and then with a with a uh, demolition of, of a you know 70s or 80s building in the back, and and uh, construction of a new new addition. But you know we'll we'll encounter a lot of the same types of issues. You know the slate roof, the uh, the you know the extensive woodwork, and how do we refinish it? How do we get new systems into an into a historic building? So. Yeah, Frank, Frank and his team have developed a lot of uh, know-how about how to do that, and that translates into a, uh, having confidence that these are the right numbers. Okay. The, the only thing I would differ on the Shrewsbury, they, they ended up buying an extra parcel to build their building, and we're, we're building ours on a postage stamp. So there's a little bit they, of they, they did. They, they were fortunate. I live in Shrewsbury. I... I, I uh, I, they were very fortunate to to, uh, to have that capability. It would have been nice to have uh, gained the spur house, but I, I understand that that wasn't <laughs> wasn't in the cards. So, uh, la la last question. I'm sorry, Andrew. No, just no just uh, and uh, you know, I th I think the frustrating part for all of us is you know that that nine million dollars that stayed the same. You know, originally it was forty percent of the construction costs. Now it's you know, no, 25, so. Bribe from the state? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, and the way that that works is, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's funded by a bond at the state level. So the MBLC is using that bond to fund the projects that they have committed to. So when we made our ask for additional funds, um, there are no additional funds. Uh, the only way that they, they could give us additional funds would be to take away someone else's grant. And if they came to us and said, we're taking away your grant and we're giving it to Amherst, that would not fly. That would not go over well. Um, so what we have done uh, in the last probably four days, the, all of the waitlisted library directors have gotten together and we... Hey, hang on a second, Maureen. I know what you're going to say because I, I watched the presentation. Um, before you say it, then you can choose not to. Um, I am concerned that we d we won't have an answer on that no, we before won't. the town meeting. We won't before town okay. meeting. And and so my concern is if that's if we say that publicly, again, that 
that might influence the voters at the town meeting where the project should be able to stand on its own merits. And I leave it to you if you want to say it. But well, my point in bringing it up is that we are doing everything we can to find additional funds for this you. project. And whether we find that out before on October 16th or November 1st or January of next year, we're still going to keep looking, beating the bushes, trying to find additional grants and other opportunities for funding for this project. So yeah, appreciate I can, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thank you. Now it feels like gossip. I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can watch the video, apparently. I know. I should go video. back now. I'm intrigued. You can watch the video. But, but you know, my, my perspective is we could talk about it here because people are definitely lined up for the next episode of the AFC. <laughs> uh, Andrew? Just if I may put on my sustainable Westboro hat and my fails hat at the same time, um, just as an open-ended question, um, what conversations have been had about you know the, the long-term, the green uh, initiatives that may be included in this or not, because green tends to be more expensive up front. Mm -hmm. And I, I realize that it was already difficult changing the cost as it is. But I, I would, it, this is also the time to do it most cost effectively rather than bolting it on as something you do later. So just as an open-ended question, what has the green conversation been about this building? We had a fantastic presentation early on, um, I think November-ish of last year with Pete Dunbeck from Sustainable Westboro, who filled us in on all of the details surrounding green initiatives at the state level and um, the climate action plan. Um, I'm happy to say Steve is now a member, a voting member of the Library Building Committee. So he'll be, um, his contributions will really help us keep the green initiatives at the forefront. And I'll ask Eric to talk about some of the features that they've incorporated into the new design. So, so we, uh, we are proposing to get away from fossil fuels, natural gas. Right now, your, system, your, your heating and your uh, domestic water heating systems are gas-fired boilers. And even though they're, they're, I think, 2012, by the time the project is complete, they'll be closing in on 50. 12 to 15 years old and uh, out of warranty and may not work with, with a new system. So we're, we're proposing to t change those out to, uh, to electric heat pumps and, and uh, you know, we're, we're looking at all LED lighting. Uh, we're looking at uh, a photovoltaic panel system on part of the, uh, part of the roof. Um, we've had some conversations in addition to our conversations with Pete Dunbeck and uh, about the climate action plan. We've also s started conversations with the utility company National Grid and Mass Save about uh, potential rebates um, for high high efficiency uh, design and and equipment. So uh, that's in a nutshell, kind of where where we're heading heading with that. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> so so my, my last question, and then I'll shut up. But. Uh, um, so I, I appreciate this is being presented as a once in a lifetime opportunity, but I, we, as you stated, there's also another grant round coming up. And I know when you had the uh, MBLC, they, they certainly are hoping that they'll be able to fund projects at a larger percentage than 25%. And uh, you know, I, I think uh, you know if it doesn't go through, we'd certainly encourage you to uh, to try for the next grant round where the there might be more money available. Speaking. Uh, of I, I w just want to make sure everybody has realistic expectations about the next grant round because, as I mentioned earlier, it, um, they've indicated that they would like to offer another grant round, but they're changing the regulations, they're changing the whole system that they use to evaluate and award grants, and that has to go through a whole regulatory process and uh, be approved, and then a bond has to be sought and issued and funded before they can announce a, another grant round. So if all the pieces align like they should, my consultant at MBLC uh, told me that the, the earliest there would possibly be um, 
grants would be 2028. And as we explained, our building is not gonna, going to make it through to that point, added to the fact that if we pass on this now, and if we decide to try and bring it, you know, resurrect it, start, scrap all of our 10 years of work and start over, in, um, in the next round, we'll be competing with other towns who may pass over theirs, who, um, you know, for whatever reason might not do their project at this point as well as the 40 other towns that expressed interest in a future grant round. So there's, we're, not, we're not guaranteed to get another grant, and if we were awarded a grant and somehow waitlisted again, we're talking about a generation going by before we would have this opportunity again. So I really strongly, passionately believe that we have $9.4 million towards this project now it's not going to get cheaper as the time goes on. And, you know, frankly, if we waited, we will probably be, end up spending at least this much in 10 years or 12 years, and we'll still have to do repairs that we outlined earlier in the meantime. So then we're repairing things that, you know, a few years later we'll be tearing out. And that's not a, a you know, it's not the way we steward the town's money. So we, you know, we've put a lot of time, a lot of thought, and a lot of deliberate action into this plan, and this is really the time to do it. I appreciate you've invested quite a bit, and I know both you and the trustees have invested a lot of your heart and soul into putting this together over the last 10 years. But I really want to go back and look at Plan B for a minute, even though I know we're your intent on rolling the dice on the current project or the proposed project. Uh, I mean, you yourself have said it's a very high level look at numbers. Wouldn't it have been a good investment to hire a firm to literally come in and do an accurate or as close as possible to an accurate estimate of what it would cost to give the town an alternative choice? And wouldn't a plan B be able to still fulfill the mission of the library? So I appreciate what you're saying. We didn't have the funds to be able to hire a firm to do a design that would be grant worthy and to pay a firm to do a plan B. So we chose to go with the, the firm that was going to do the renovation expansion that had grant funds attached to it. All of the fees to this point for our designer, our construction manager, and our OPM for the last 10 years have been paid primarily by library trust funds that are under the control of the Board of Trustees. Those are funds that have been left to us over the years by residents who have passed away some have uh, certain restrictions, others don't. And it's, um, it's funds that we spend very carefully because they're dependent on interest to grow. And so we know when we make an expenditure from one of those trust funds, it's gonna be a long time to recover those funds back. But we felt that this was a good investment. Um, but there was no way that we could support two in-depth studies to in-depth designs to that level. So we chose to do this one. It just, it, it, and I, this is just my personal feeling about it. It just kind of says to the town, take it or leave it. You don't have a choice. And I would have thought that maybe we could go back and ask the town for a specific amount of money to do an estimate on a plan B before we committed to a 36 plus million dollar project that is gonna have a financial impact on every taxpayer in this town for the next 15 to 20 years. 
to me, you know, if, if you're million, suggesting that we do that now, well, that would mean that would I mean, mean we're kind of caught between a rock and a million dollars. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, we're caught between a rock and a hard place. So we're we're being given a choice of spending thirty six million dollars um, without an alternative because we're not sure if that eighteen million dollars is really correct. It could be substantially smaller in terms of the work that's got to be done. I feel like that's the best number that we could do at this point. At this and point. I also feel like our our team has the expertise and the knowledge, the in-depth knowledge to be able to give us a, a decent enough number that it's not pie in the sky. Okay, that's a fair answer. Yeah. yeah. I, I just wanted to... Uh, offer a few thoughts. I, um, we've done a lot of renovation projects and, and uh, you know there's there's sometimes a misconception that renovation is 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 uh, less expensive than new construction that it that you know it's it's kind of cosmetic fixes but I, I just wanted to point out some of the things that would need to be achieved with even a relatively small renovation project. You, you'd need to make the building fully compliant with that current accessibility throughout you know that would that would mean replacing the existing elevator it's not it, it doesn't need code for current accessibility code you'd need to replace that whole ramp you know because it's too stamp it's too steep right now you'd still need to install a fire suppression system um, throughout the building you'd, you'd still need to meet the you know the new energy code so you, you'd be You'd be replacing all the windows, you know, the roof, the wall, insulation, the lighting. Um, you, you would have to do structural upgrades. You'd have to meet seismic loads and new gravity loads on the building. You know, there's no telling whether the existing roof framing is, is uh, strong enough to support new, new rooftop equipment. So you could potentially be spending a lot of money to reinforce what's, what's already there. You know, you'd still have to do a full uh, hazmat abatement of the entire building throughout, and and uh, you know, site utilities would need to be would need to be uh, factored in. Um, you know, so the, 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 they're, it, it's pretty significant. I I've wondered myself if if the Plan B number is even enough. It, it could be. You, you know, you, you you said yourself that it. You know, you'd hope you'd hope that it maybe could be could be lower, but it, it, in actuality, you could go through that process and find out that it's even more expensive than than uh, than what we what we estimated. Um, but at least we wouldn't be asking the questions, "What if?" Well, I, I have to and say, I know there's no absolute. So well, I'm thinking about other projects we have, like the senior center we've talked about, like Hastings that we t we touched Hastings and suddenly had to do a whole bunch of other work, ADA and fire suppression, and so I, I the, it's a six figure cost to go through and do these things, and I'm not sure we put the same expectation. Although it would be very nice to have full on A B alternatives for other things, um, I absolutely sympathize with the the interest in having more. But I don't know that we put the same expectations on other projects like I, I'm hearing it asked for here for the library. It, it doesn't matter whether we did it or not before. This is well, we're still not doing it now. I mean, we've about. talked to the senior center. We didn't say, give us $200,000 worth of research for your two different sites you were thinking of. Listen, so I, I'm, I, not, I'm, I'm, I'm not. sympathetic for the ask. I'm just saying that if this is something that we do feel is important, it's something we should be asking for every one of these construction projects, and it ain't cheap. It really Going isn't. No, Most of the time, that. it comes from the town costs too. But it's better to spend. You know, it's better to understand what it's going to cost you to get that estimate yep. than coming out the other side without it and finding it's substantially more expensive. Well, and I, I think our our plan B here also has to be looked at not as a plan B, but it is the basic cost of keeping that building there, because. That ADA compliance, the fire suppression compliance, all, all those things will have to happen at some point. The moment we change out windows, that's a, 20, a $10 million project. And, and with all due respect, but also just being very candid about it, that $19 million project cost right now estimate comes from somebody who is trying to make the other option look better. So I'm not saying there's lies, but practically speaking, 
the same person who's saying that the, you know, the, the less attractive option has a reason to think that that's going to be more expensive or, or, or paint a more expensive set of alternatives. So th there's a lot of pluses and minuses to the whole thing. Uh, and again, sympathetic to the, the wish that we could have more, but having something as informed as that, we just have to realize anything, if we want to keep that building at all running as a library, we as a town will be spending 10, 12, 15 million dollars, maybe 19 million, <laughs> to keep it where it is. That is table stakes, and that's not going away. No, Unless but I, 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 I understand what you're saying, and I understand yeah. what they're presenting. I just don't want to see perfection be the enemy of good, if you understand what I'm getting at. Oh, well, I do, but that's the statement about saying, you know, let's get another estimate and see what the alternative is. So that would be the perfection. All right, All right fine. <laughs> gotcha. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> so I have one final question. Why is this project more important than any of the other projects that are in circulation being discussed um, for Westboro, such as the a new senior center, uh, a multi-generational center, a fire substation, um, you know, infrastructure issues that DPW has to deal with for water and sewer. I think it's um, unwise to pit one against the other. Um, I will not say that any other project is unnecessary. I think they're all necessary. I think they're all important. And I don't think any one of them comes with a pot of $9.4 million to help pay for it. Our schools have grants that help pay for their projects, but I don't know of an, a single other municipal building that we, we can build where a third, almost a third of the project is paid for by the state. Uh, we, we've explained for 10 years why we need this, why our community deserves it, and they have told us loudly that they want it. Uh, part of the original analysis of this project was whether we would keep the library at its current location on Main Street or build new, because as we know, new construction is cheaper and easier, and the community spoke out loudly in all of our surveys, focus groups that we did over the years saying we want it to remain at 55 West Main. So we're giving the residents, the um, taxpayers, the library that they want, that they've told us they want, that they need, and frankly that I think they deserve. We can't function as a true 21st century library in a building that was built for 1980 technology. So I'll add in there, Maureen, that the library serves everyone in town. There's not one portion of our population we don't service. We're for everybody. And I, I heard a state legislator say it once at a legislative breakfast that libraries are the one municipal service that we encourage people to use every day. And outside of DPW, if you're using any other town service every single day, there's some big problems. We don't want you using police every day. We don't want you using fire every day. But we want you coming to the library every day. And we welcome you and we want you to come. But the reality is we live in a community where police and fire are being used every day. But not by an individual resident is what I mean. Yeah, like if I'm calling the police every single day, there's a big problem there. But I should not be using all of their tools, resources their every day. Their tools are being worn down and their tools are really, really expensive. Correct. And As so, are ours. Yeah. But again, I think, and, and I, listen, I'm a huge reader, so I'm, I'm all about libraries, but you, differentiating need from want, I, I don't perceive a library as a need, especially with an expansion of 12,000 square feet. That's I think, I think there are a lot of people in town who would disagree with you on that, and especially the people that we served during COVID. I have countless quotes from people um, on our community survey we did earlier this month who said that the library was an absolute lifeline for them during COVID when we were able to provide materials curbside so that they had books and they, had, they could keep educating their children, they could be entertained, uh, that they would have books to read to forget about the pandemic for a little while. We pivoted our services and we kept materials flowing. 
We delivered things to people's homes, dropped them on the front porch. Uh, we made sure that people in town were taken care of. And when we reopened, I worked shifts at our greeter desk. We had to count the number of people in the building because we had capacity limits because of COVID. And um, an example is a gentleman who had just retired uh, right as the pandemic hit and told me, please don't ever close again because I come here every single day and I don't know what I would do if you closed. I just retired and I have no one to talk to at home and at least if I can only spend 20 minutes here, I can come in and talk to people for 20 minutes and that has made all the difference in what I'm in my life. So it's, some people may not see it as a need, but there are others that it is an absolute critical need. And there's others that come to our library to seek our Wi-Fi and our computers so that they can search for jobs. And that's been a, an increasing need of our library because they don't have it at home. We provide hotspots for people so that they can have the internet at their house so that they can look for jobs and now they're out of jobs. And they're using those services from the library for that very basic, their needs. Did you want to see a Z? I I am Are there any other questions from the committee? Z, I know you're, uh, you've been a little quiet up there. Still quiet. I have a question. Okay, go ahead. So um, we talked about the Shrewd Street Library and uh, the renovation there. I passed by it and I know, uh, looking at some comparisons, uh, you know, the town population of Westboro versus Shrewsbury is uh, quite a bit of difference uh, higher in Shrewsbury. The cost of that library, what I got from the other sources was somewhere in mid twenties. Yes, they had a um, uh, lot of land, they, they had a new piece of land and most of the building is on a, uh, on a uh, new land, which is easier to build than to renovate. What I've heard the plan B, <laughs> I, I'm late coming into the town, the AFC, is right from the very beginning, I don't know if there was any concentration to have built a new library at a, much, at a new site would be much cheaper. You know, all the necessity, everything which I've heard is right. Everybody needs a library, everybody needs, but at what cost? That is the most important question to me. You know, all these people who have said, yes, I want a library. If we, we present the cost to them, this is the cost for you coming to the library and doing this. You know, everybody was raised the, raised the eyebrows. That's what it, the difference is. It's not that it's not needed. It's uh, a lot of people use it. A lot of people come every day. All those are correct, but the cost to this and for the whole generation, yes, this library will be used by the gen uh, next generation, but the cost will be for the next generation as well. Okay. Was there a question? Was there, <laughs> see, I didn't, I, forgive me, I didn't hear, I don't think we heard a question. The question is like, why would this be 36 million versus the Shrewsbury, which was around 25 million? even though that library size is not smaller than this library. Oh. Okay. That one's done. And they have a larger population. Would one of you like to tackle that? I mean, it, it was it was completed in 2000, what year, Eric? Two years ago? We started working on the Shrewsbury Library in 2013. So the work started in 2013? Well, at that library? Our, our work, the design work, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just costs have increased since 2013 and then throw in the pandemic, the um, pandemic era supply chain issues, um, construction material costs, labor costs, and uh, that's where, and this period of historic inflation that we're currently living through uh, all of those have been drivers for the cost increase for this project. I, I think it might be fair to say if this project was completed in 2019, which is what the 2016 estimate did, it was $24 million. Yes, correct. Which is a similar number. Yeah. So the difference between the $24 million and the $32 million, $36 million, sorry, is the difference between then and now. So I think that might be part of the answer. Last three years, construction materials way up. 
Any other questions from the committee? Okay, folks, thank you thank for you. standing on your feet for thank such you. a long time. We appreciate your candor and your responses to our question. Monday night, we're going to be looking at the tax implications of this project, uh, and you're certainly welcome to return if you'd like. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for asking the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. We'll give our guests a chance to... Uh, Does anybody want to take a quick recess? Say like we plow right through. Okay. Yep. Now I'm gonna go home. <laughs> gonna go exactly. Home. <laughs> it's been a long day. Okay. okay uh, next order of business is the uh, approval of the minutes of the meeting of September 12th, which was Monday. May I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. 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 Go to a roll call vote. Andrew, we'll start with you. Bradley, yes. Board, yes. Oh, just go. <laughs> McMahon, yes. <laughs> Leslie, yes. Already, yes. Jafford, yes. Z. Abstain. Abstain. Okay. Thank you. Six oh one. Six oh one. Are there any liaison reports? Just very briefly, I, yes. I spoke with uh, the with uh, Pete from. Uh, Sustainable so Westboro, and they had their, their first meeting yesterday, and I, I, it pained me that I couldn't make it, but he did tell me that the next meeting they have in a month, they're planning on introducing me and, and getting me circulated then, and he and I are probably going to touch base before then um, to get a, an idea. And, it, and it's, it was his questions to me um, and to, uh, you know, also in the work that I do on fails with regards to the greening of the building and what was, what was happening. So... The question came as a direct result of the conversations I've already started having with Westboro. And you've been copied on my conversations with the chief, and yep. um, we, will, we will see how soon I can find out a uh, uh, former chief. Um, chief. And I didn't realize that as I called him Alan. I'm like, I'm like you're, you're chief. What the hell? Um, that was my mistake. So um, hopefully I'll, I'll know more about uh, the, the municipal building committee and where we stand. Great. So. He's also a member of this committee, this uh, library building committee. Oh, is he? Yeah. Oh. He was the carryover from the municipal building because of their experience, too, on the renovation. Okay. It's a small and, town. And I understand Capital Planning Committee is going to start meeting very soon? Uh, that'd be news to me, but I'm okay. delighted. Right. Well, <laughs> let's say I had an inquiry about your availability <laughs> because they meet on Monday and Thursday as well. Oh, do they? Uh -huh. Yes. If our memory serves, it was at 6 o'clock. So... Whatever, but yeah, historically I've been able to do both of them. Well, I okay, good, because I, I my response to the question was, I trust Alan's judgment to <laughs> attend yeah. meetings of his choice when he sees a conflict. Well, school building committees usually meet Thursdays at four, so it mean four to five thirty, okay. five to six, six. Right, well, we'll figure it out. Okay, I trust sure. they're not going to throw us out of the room. What, this room? Yeah. No. Okay, good. <laughs> no, they're not in this room. Let's not go through that again. Um, as far as future draft agendas are concerned, Monday we're meeting with uh, Christy Williams and Leah Talbot, and uh, we're going to be going over several, of ar several articles. I was told today there's a new version, V3, of the warrant is coming out tomorrow. Uh, which will add a few more articles to our discussion Monday evening. I will be sending out all the material tomorrow for Monday. Um, and then um, at that point, we can decide on Monday, we can decide on whether or not we hold a meeting on Thursday. Because subsequent to Thursday, um, which is the 22nd, we have the warrant closing on the 27th. And we have to wait till the warrant closes before we start voting. And then on Thursday, the, tw the sorry, Monday the 26th, the day before the warrant closes, is a holiday. Um, and then on the 29th, which is two weeks from, a week, where are we? It's a week from Thursday. Um, we have that joint fall budget meeting with the uh, school committee and the select board. And then the plan going forward after that, and that'll focus on, by the way, fiscal 24. 
not fit current fiscal year. Okay, going to be looking at issues that will crop up from a budget perspective in fiscal 24. And then subsequent to that, on October 3rd, we'll begin voting on the, uh, the existing warrant. And we'd like to have that wrapped up before uh, the weekend, so the 3rd and the 6th, uh, because we have to put together the report and recommendations of this committee. Now, we may decide when we go through the warrants for voting to hold off on some of them until the town meeting itself and vote on them on the town me at the town meeting. So when the town, for you, for Rod and Gene, when we go to the town meeting, we convene a meeting of the AFC and we meet concurrently with the town meeting and we adjourn when the town meeting adjourns. But we'll have an opportunity to conduct some business as a committee um, while we're at that meeting. So we may be voting on some of the articles at that meeting. And we'll have a better handle on that after uh, or when we start voting on all of them on October 3rd. Okay, everybody all set? Any other questions, anything that, uh, I thought I thought these folks, um, they had a lot of stamina standing there for as long as they did. They did a great job. They, yep. they did a very, very good job in responding. Um, and I, you know, I think uh, Monday's meeting is going to add additional information to our conversation. And I was out of the room for a piece of it, but did they address parking? I think you started in. On, I think or, and, Andrew or did, that you but, yeah, but uh, there's no there's no uh, resolution to any sort of parking issues. Only no. to say, and and it's it's right, and and this goes back a couple of years when the case was asked before, and that is, the library has no control over, uh, and there's no part of the scope of their project that involves parking, which doesn't, in my mind, really answer the question, which is where are people supposed to go and where are they going to park and and what is the capacity for this. Um, so it, it, it hasn't, their, their position hasn't changed. And, and realistically, I understand why they can't control the parking. It's not in the scope of their budget. That, that, that is absolutely accurate. But I, I, I still yearn for the idea that somebody is addressing where we're going to put all these extra people with this extra capacity and, and where, they go, where they're going to go. Um, well, and so. I think, again, this would be the second thing that we looked at as a committee because that splash pad was another concern with regard to parking. So we're coming up with all these ideas for, you know, unity in the community, and where are people going to park? Mm -hmm. Well, the splash pad. Splash pad happened. I know it was going to be over here, but Bay State Commons. There's I know, but people were concerned about parking, M intermixing it with um, retail parking. Yeah. Was retail going to be displaced? There's also residential right there at the splash pad. Were they going to? I mean, there was a lot of questions. I'm just saying, yep. it, the location, I guess, is ideal. It, it, at the time, your town was built on a square, I'm assuming, and its location is great, but the parking is crap. It's better well, than see, the, <laughs> the thing is, this, the select board um, created a study of parking, and the result of the people who did the parking study said there's a lot of parking available. Plenty of parking. And I think a lot of people don't take advantage of the lots that are, like, behind here and other places. It's not always right in front of the building, but I think that was their, the answers. As you can see, mo most of the people, I think, were surprised by those answers, but that's the answer they got. So the, that kind of stifled any sort of state money, I think, for, yeah. uh, for additional parking. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Sean might know more about it. But, but if you want to promote elderly going, right, wouldn't you yeah. want the most convenient parking for elderly? Of course, right? Well, that's why it's yeah. one-hour parking there. So it is really for people dropping by. It's not... All those spots, they're not meant for people staying all day. If we have plenty of parking in town, it's just not beneficially located, you know, for some of the buildings. Um, you know, when they try to purchase the property or they were talking about purchasing the property on Grove Street for 600000 to add, so people in the Forbes building would have additional parking, um, they couldn't prove the value issue. And... Um, and everybody knows that it's nice when the weather is beautiful 
But as soon as that bad weather comes, they're going to just get as close to the building as they right. can again. Yeah. So, you know, it's going to be a conundrum for the library. If, if, they're, if they're hope for projections of increased utilization come true, then, then we are going to have to deal with a parking problem. But that's a select board problem, <laughs> not us. <laughs> well, and I, Until I think, they come to town meeting. Until they come to town meeting, right. And I, I, my, my own personal advocacy on the thought has been, and this is uh, something that um, I, I've been told the time has passed to be concerned about, is, is that this building is, like I said, it's table stakes. It's probably not going to go anywhere. But we have three projects that are going to sound very, very similar. A senior center requires room for seniors to do their thing, as well as a lot of joint space where they can meet. A library is a place that has a lot of books with places where people get, need to meet. And the community center is where kids have some activities and a lot of spaces where people need to meet. And there's a Venn diagram there that says, you know, we could sustain that building at a lower cost than the cost of the project, and then when we're ready, commit to a community center that has room for seniors that can have an area for certain subject matters of the library. And, and I can imagine that and the seniors there as well, and there's a lot of material in this library that we could transplant from this library and put somewhere else so that we would have two library centers. One here to keep this one going because this is a great one for the kids in the school, high school, mm -hmm. middle school, a great walking location. They do have a lot of programming for them and it is always booked solid. So there's, a, there's, a, there's still a use to keep it here but in my mind, there's still another opportunity, and maybe it's for the younger kids, for the rec area, as well as seniors, where we're talking about the need to have large air amounts of open space, as well as multiple little functional units that plug onto that. Yeah. A library, community center, senior yeah. center. Well, Maureen, on Tuesday night with the select board, Maureen was pretty specific that um, the library would function as, as not just the library, but as an intergenerational uh, facility as, you know, as well. Um, which, you know, says, okay, they're going to try to incorporate some of the concepts around the multi-generational uh, project that people have been batting around. And nothing, there's yep. been nothing official out in the open about it, as far as I know. But um, whatever you do, that increases utilization of that building is going to is going to stress yeah. not just the parking, but that stress is going to roll over into certain demographics within the community, and you yeah. know, like the elderly. Which is why moving it to a senior center makes a lot of sense. But leave, using it for the high school kids and the middle school kids does zero for parking. Like they're just walking. Yeah. Home. So it, it, just a thought. Yeah. Um, but in my mind, that's... Well, but, you know, you're going to spend $36 million, million yeah. on a lot of bucks on, on a library, and then you're going to be talking about a, a multi-generational center, uh, which is going to function in many ways, just like the library is hoping to function. And then you're going to talk about a senior center, which is going to function in many ways, like the library is talking about function. Which is why I'm saying $15 million here... And then one building, one ring There's that a serves lot of, them all. A lot of real estate around town that could be converted into what he's talking about. So, yeah. so you want to spend thirty-six million, and we can have this discussion. I didn't. I'm I'm yeah. against the thirty-six. Unfortunately, I love the library. I, I'm yeah. a huge yes. library, but I, I'm for the fifteen million plus. Let's put another library as part of a larger project, and that one might be thirty or forty million dollars. But you know what? We're meeting three town needs with that not just one, and all of those three town needs have at their core, we need open spaces yeah. for people to get together. Well, look, you know, Maureen said that she's got a lot of information from yeah. people that they want this. Um, and that's why I was, you know, but, but I haven't seen it. And that's why I was so terribly disappointed that we did not go forward with a debt exclusion vote to give the town, a, gr a, a greater percentage of the population, a chance to express their opinion on this project. Because when we go to town meeting, you know we're not going to see anywhere near the percentage that's going to make, you know, that's going to have an impact on, on opinion. 
they're gonna you're gonna have a small block of people like that are gonna vote for. this, and that's that. I'm not saying it's a fait accompli, but we all know how this form of government works. Dr. Siddiqui has a question. Zephyr? Yeah, so what I was saying at that moment was like, yes, a lot of people need it. Do they need it at $36 million? That's a big question. If it's $6 million, yes, no problem for the town. What I would see, that, you know, this has to be grand rethinking in terms of this started 10 years ago, as everybody was saying. But why didn't people did not think to take a big open piece of land where we would have enough parking, a senior center, a multi-generation center, and a library in one complex in a place which is easily accessible, like you know, somewhere where people can reach easily. That $36 million is a lot of money. You know, you can build a, a, a so much real estate in a new place compared to trying to renovate this old building. You know, thing you're my thinking about is in, million. in the direction compared to trying to invest to so much money in this too. old building. And again, it will need 10 years to. down the line, it will need more repairs and renovation. Or multi yeah. Well, you got a point, but we're, yeah. you know, I keep hearing we're not going to get, you know, we're only going to get one bite at this $9 million apple. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, and... So the, the, it seems the reality, be, though, is yeah. it's left downtown because a big chunk of your people that want to use the library can walk after school and can walk there. And that's what their information was from 2012. You might not agree because maybe we all drive cars and we're happy driving to places where there's lots of parking. But that's not what the decision was made. So you, know, no, you can, look, vote, you can vote against it. I just don't think that this concept of some 60 to 80 million dollar giant center is going to get uh, that type of support well, either. Yeah, I agree with Without that. any state funding. But mm -hmm. what, what concerns me is we do the library and then you know there's gonna be a, a group of people who are gonna push hard on the next project and the next project which is, you know, and I'm, it could see, we haven't seen, we and we won't until after the first of the year, probably not until just before annual town meeting, we won't see the results of the senior center. Uh, I mean, the senior assessment. So we have no, and I don't have any idea of what kind of questions they're asking, but we have no idea whether or not the seniors in this town want this because they are being claimed as a demographic that will use this new they are a demographic that use okay the facility okay. now no, no, no. what not... i asked a let specific question point. let me finish my point okay okay Go ahead. we we and and i and i grant i'd well, like I, to I'll talk you, sometime of Mike. course you will all right but but and i'm not saying they're they claim they're claiming as in you know quotes around it they're laying claim to the seniors the senior center is laying claim to the seniors People who are advocating a multi-generational center are laying claim to the seniors, but we haven't heard from the seniors yet. So we're being asked to make a decision, a recommendation, you know, with the information we have, and we're gonna do the best we can. I'm sorry, go ahead. My point is that when we had a meeting, was it the joint meeting uh, last year, when we talked about a multi-generational center, I said, we have one. It's called the library. It already is a multi-generational center. And there was a great dispute between some seniors who want a seniors-only facility and this so-called multi-generational one. I think that's what the study is supposed to sort through, because we have a senior center right now. Whether it needs to be improved, different, I don't know. But there, there isn't like making a claim like this is anything new. This, this the library's always been a multi-generational center. You can go there when you're six months old or to when you're 99.9. .9. It doesn't matter. It's a it's a facility that's open to everyone. And so, the fact that there are the other other projects coming down the pipe, maybe, well, they'll have to stand on their two legs too. And I'm not sure um, whether they'll make sense or not. 
I don't know where there is this large piece of property that we can put all these places and people can still bicycle or walk to. We'll see. Well, I mean, that, that's coming. Uh, you mean next to Lake Chauncey? <laughs> yeah, that's not that convenient. <laughs> To, if you're you're getting out of school at uh, Armstrong or High School, you're going to hike to Lake Chauncey. No, no, the high school right. kids couldn't go here. But they were they were built. Well, that means us. we have to fix the library. Yes. Yeah. If we plan on using that building, I don't think that was stop. part of Mike's discussion. But that, like, if there's anything that's going to be done in this library for the next three to five years at all, we need to spend fifteen to twenty million dollars on that. Ten to fifteen, twenty million. End of discussion. That is right. coming. Unless which, we choose to which, walk away from that building, which why it makes sense cost is coming. to spend twenty-seven million and have a fifty-year nice, as you want it building instead of twenty million, twenty million, seven million less, to get a band-aided building that's still only, only two to stories. still have us do another twenty-five million dollar seniors, twenty-five million dollar community. But uh, yeah, uh, I'm uh, talking to the thing that's on the town meeting, Warren. I can't talk to you about projects that aren't even uh i've seen no concept sketches or drawings or even true true of, of these other things so i i just look at it as i think this is a good investment they got the pictures first so you know, they've been working on it for many many but, but years we, i mean that's a little condescending <laughs> no the the, the, <laughs> the need for this from all of those different groups is, is is totally valid with or without yeah. the pictures i mean yeah so I think I'm hearing, and I totally understand wanting to spend the 30 million, the 35 million there, minus the 9 million, or however we want to frame it. So, I, and I understand that, but to me, that gets us one building when, in fact, I think that the need for a community, a space for people to go with other needs around it is something that, that is, is defined. Other people are already talking about. We have buildings that meet those needs to some extent. That there's just at this point the senior center is, is not long on its legs to, if if they're to be believed, um, yeah. And so I have no problem having two different library locations serving different needs. As it is, one in tw I guess the latest number was one in thirteen or one in fourteen pieces of material that are checked out are not checked out on the spot. They're ordered and then picked up. So. We already have a, a usage model where it's normal for people to say, hey, I would request this, I'm gonna go get it. So that, that the idea you walk in and it's there, you, you, that doesn't exist for, for like right off the top for 8% of the, the checkouts. So the idea of having two separate locations, one downtown meets one set of clientele or a couple different topics, and one that goes to a larger area that could be served with the seniors, that could be served with you know, that, that's it. In my mind, that meets both needs. Wouldn't, wouldn't that cost a lot more? more than twice as much as this project? Well, it depends on what you're building in that other building. I mean, if yes. you're talking about $25 million for a senior center, ish. If you're talking about $25 million for a rec center, ish. We're up to $50 million. Plus a portion of what would this? Let's say it's the unused portion of the, the, the let's say it's a $15 million job to renovate which is, I think, is probably closer, but maybe, let's just say 15, unless you want to say 20, we say 20. The difference is $16 million if it's 20 million. So we have a 25 million, 25 million, 16 million. Can we get a, a cent? We put a whole school together that is LEED certified top shelf for $60 million. This Two doesn't years need ago. to be that big. It can be smaller, <laughs> but just with a lot more community spaces that can be repurposed to a lot of other people. Just so you understand that school would probably with a 54% increase in construction costs, probably be so another $20 million. Million. That's just yeah. transitory. <laughs> no, just transitory. It's not going backwards. No, just, <laughs> just, just. Okay. I, we, this, Motion to adjourn. Yes. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. We can continue this we on have, Monday. We have a, yes, we can, and Thursday if we want to come back. Uh, we, have a, we have a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Second. All right. Roll call vote. Bradley, yes. Board, yes. McMahon, yes. Leslie, yes. Ready, yes. Jaffer, yes. Zaffer? Zaffer, yes. Thank you. Do we need to take these with us? John, thank you very much. Good we're, to see you, Dr. Suyiki. We're back here on Monday. <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, it's uh, my new job. Yeah.